So welcome to the second um, podcast of the OpenCL series. Uh, this will be uh, podcast number two, OpenCL Fundamentals. Uh, these podcasts are being brought to you by uh, MacResearch.org. Uh, my name is Dave Gohara, and uh, my contact information is up there. You can uh, get a hold of me by email or uh, on Twitter if you use it. And um, if you have any questions or comments or ideas for uh future uh, episodes. Um, I want to thank everybody for their feedback so far on the first uh, on the first podcast. A lot of a lot of great feedback. Um, some really good questions and uh, we'll actually address a couple of those uh, in this in this podcast. So if you have any, uh, certainly send them my way. Uh, I'd like to do a little bit of quick um, housekeeping here. Uh, first, I want to actually thank our um, hosting service, uh, Macius. They uh, actually host the macresearch.org uh, web server in their facility, and uh, they uh, they really help us out quite a bit by giving us, um, you know, a lot of uh, you know a lot of uh, good bandwidth. And uh, when something when we need somebody to go and do something, you know, physically with the server and whatnot, they're really great guys. And so they've been really good to us. And so I wanted to give them uh, a quick thank you. Uh, there were a couple questions actually that came through uh, via email, and probably some of the most the more common ones uh, I'd like to address right now. Um, the first one was uh, supported graphics cards. Uh, for using OpenCL in Snow Leopard. So, of course, we know that uh, as long as you have a CPU, of course, you can use OpenCL, but people want to know, well, you know, what kind of graphics cards. Uh, this is actually the, the list of the graphics cards. So, if you have a Mac, uh, MacBook Pro, any kind of Mac that has any one of these graphics cards in it, uh, you will also be able to use OpenCL with your graphics card. So you'll be able to take advantage of that. And in fact, all of the technical specifications for uh, being able to run uh, Snow Leopard and what you know what's in what's in Snow Leopard and, and things like that are on our listed on Apple's website uh, www.apple.com slash Mac OS 10 X I guess but 10 slash uh, specs.html so if you go there you can get all of the information but this is the information regarding the graphics card so if you have one of those you're you're pretty much set and all new Macs that are shipping as of you know uh, at least a few months ago probably WWDC so uh, June or so are all OpenCL uh, capable so uh, the second question, uh, which was actually a really, really good question, uh, and this one came through uh, a couple times. I had talked about uh, GPU performance and why these things are such you know, um, beasts in terms of their floating point um, uh, abilities and, and whatnot. And so I thought I'd really answer this question uh, from a hardware side because uh, I think, I think it, it makes a little bit more sense when we think about it this way and, and why it is. And so uh, up here what we're looking at are two – two types of uh, processing units. One is uh, a CPU and the other one is the, a GPU. This is from a, uh, the one on the left is the CPU is a Core 2 Duo. Um, this one I believe is a Conroe, so it's kind of old. It's actually two or three years old, I believe. Uh, but it, it, it illustrates the point. This is a two-core uh, chip um, and what, one of the things you'll notice if you if you look at this is that you know I mean it kind of looks like a city map almost but one of the things that you really notice and and I think which is quite amazing is you see these big blocks of stuff down here um, these are right here this is that the the cache that you know uh, like l2 cache and, and and things like that and the purpose of cache on CPUs uh, is to hide memory latencies so when you're trying to get data from RAM down into the CPU you want to you know put stuff that's used frequently you need to kind of store it someplace and the CPU does this and the way they sort of buffer this is by putting the stuff into caches and so what you can see is that a significant portion of the die space is really being used for having some really fast local memory um, whereas if you contrast that with the GPU uh, there's very little to there's very little cache on these things at all in fact uh, most most of the things that you'll do on a GPU aren't cache backed at all. Um, the, you know, if you if you look at it, these areas here uh, are the uh, shader processing, fragment shader processing units. Uh, memory controllers are here. Uh, these areas here, 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 and here are the texture processing units. And right here in the middle, um, I believe, is the uh, thread management hardware. So that's another important thing too, which we'll talk about uh, a, a little bit later, uh, is um, that GPUs manage threads 
and hardware, which is a very, very important concept um, and why they can do things very, very uh, quickly. Um, and it's important uh, also for, for example, and being able to hide uh, memory latencies and things like that. But the point is, is that there's very little of this die space that's actually being used uh, for local memory. All of it's devoted to just the, you know, the transistors that are involved in doing, you know, math and processing of information. Whereas on the CPU, that's not the case. And I, and I think that just sort of look Looking at these from the hardware point of view kind of just drives this home that the CPU, you know, 50% of it, it looks like, you know, if you just sort of, you know, look gauging it, is really just spent on having some really fast local storage uh, for, for information for the CPU to use. So that's probably one of the uh, uh, more important things to consider. And it's an important thing to consider when you're talking about performance on. Um, uh, GPUs versus CPUs. So, uh, with that said, let's let's continue actually with uh, this week's uh, or this uh, uh, current episode, I guess. Um, let's start off with talking about OpenCL objects, and and OpenCL objects comprise probably three uh, main categories. There are uh, compute devices, um, so you could think of compute objects. Um, we have memory objects, which are our data arrays or images, which are also effectively data arrays, but you know conceptually they're broken down into arrays and images and then we have executable objects that is our, our compute program which is a global con collection of, uh, of uh, things that are going to execute uh, that ex OpenCL is going to actually execute which effectively are our compute kernel so in other words uh, a, a program consists of many compute kernels and you'll see uh, that a little bit more clearly um, as we as we step through these so OpenCL objects, starting with devices. Um, a, a device, like we sort of talked about in the previous podcast, um, it's a processor. It's a it, and it's a processor of some kind that can execute data parallel programs. And so, if you think in terms of, let's say, a CPU, a four-core CPU, the compute device is the whole CPU. Each core could be a compute unit. And within each core, there are elements, there are pieces, parts and pieces that are designed to actually do the work, and those are our processing elements. Um, what do we consider to be compute devices? Well, I said CPUs. Um, GPUs, of course, are also compute devices. Um, and when we think about compute devices, we sometimes will group these things together into what are called device groups. And so a device group can be any mix of uh, compute um, objects or compute devices. Uh, and, and that's really what makes OpenCL uh, conceptually different from things such as CUDA or, um, or, or CTM or things like that, where uh, CPUs and GPUs are treated as peers. Um, but you could also have a device group that consists only of CPUs. Say if you have, you know, three or four different, like, separate CPUs within your computer, um, those could all be considered a device group. Or uh, if you have multiple GPUs, multiple graphics cards, which many computers ship nowadays with multiple graphics cards, uh, multiple graphics cards could also be um, considered a device group. So you can mix and match these and you can have them uh, all, all together and working, working together. Um, also conceptually, device groups are contained in what's called a host. Now the host in, in our case primarily is our desktop system, um, but the host can have multiple device groups within it. That is, it could consist of, you know, one collection of, say, CPUs could be considered a device group and GPUs in a second group. But the point is, is that they all exist within a single host, which for now um, is our, uh, is, is our uh, desktop system or, or laptop or something like that. Um, so that's really devices. Nothing really complicated. I mean, conceptually, it's a, it's a very simple concept, but it's something that's important to know, especially as we start talking about the specification and, and going through it. Um, there are also things like OpenCL uh, memory objects. And again, this is where we're talking about uh, arrays and images. So for arrays, arrays, again, OpenCL uh, is, uh, is C primarily. So arrays in OpenCL work exactly the same way they, they work in C. Um, that is, you have an array, um, you address the array via an, uh, a pointer, typically. Um, and um, 
and so if you're familiar with C arrays, you're familiar with arrays in OpenCL. Uh, there, there, there are probably a few little differences here and there that we'd want to talk about or things that you can use to take advantage of arrays or how you index into them and, and things like that. But by and large, we're, we're, we're talking about pretty much the same thing um, as, as you would in a standard C program. Um, the, 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 the key differences in, in arrays between CPUs and GPUs is that uh, on a CPU, uh, reads and writes on the CPU are cached. Remember we were talking in that, that picture a little bit ago, you know, where you have all this cache and, and where, where data is stored and whatnot. Um, on the GPU, they typically aren't. And I say typically because um, there are ways to cache um, uh, to cache uh, data on a GPU. You can put them in, say, like texture caches and things like that. And those things are, they're, are important under certain circumstances. Uh, but uh, by and large, you, you typically don't worry about those kinds of things at the first pass. You, you, you tend to use them when you're really trying to get a lot of optimization out of, uh, out of, out of your kernels and really kind of uh, make them scream. So um, so that's that's arrays. That's one type of memory object. The second type of memory object are uh, is is images. Um, and there are two there are two classes of images: two D and three D images, uh, in, as uh, OpenCL memory objects. Um, the image data, if you if you specify using an, uh, to use an OpenCL image type, uh, that data isn't accessible the same way you would access, say, an array. So if you had a buffer pointing to, uh, you know, image data, um, it's not exactly the same. So you can't actually use a pointer with an, with an image uh, data type in OpenCL. And uh, the, the image data is stored in a very optimized nonlinear format. So it's something that the graphics cards really want and expect. So years and years of development have gone into these kinds of things. And so uh, it's not exactly... Um, it's not, it's not exactly the same, but the important thing here is that the data reads use the texture cache. And so this is what I was kind of talking about. And there are ways to take even your own um, non-image data and effectively uh, pretend that it's an image uh, image data type to use the texture cache if you need if you need some values cached for faster access and things like that. Um, so the third thing, the third type are open uh, CL uh, executable objects. And the smallest portion of that is the compute kernel. And a compute kernel is effectively, it's a data parallel function that gets executed uh, by or on, really, the uh, compute object, so our CPU or our GPU. And if you look over here at the right-hand side, a kernel is very simple. I mean, it, it's effectively a C function. If you look at this, this is nothing more than a C function with some, you know, extra decorators that the OpenCL spec sort of um, uh, the supplies, for example, kernel, um, where you know the the memory is located, and we'll talk about that in a couple slides uh, when we talk about you know global memory and and things like that. Uh, but basically, this is really just a straightforward uh, function. And basically, let's just if we step through this, what we're saying is you know let's get um, let's just sum up two numbers from you know array A, array B, and store it in uh, the answer array. Uh, if we look at this linearly, what we can see is you know we have array A, we have array B, we're going to perform an operation on each one of the elements of this array and store it out into answer. That's effectively what we've done here. Now what you'll notice in looking at this is that there's no loop. You say, well where's the loop? I have a huge, I have an array of eight elements but you're only showing me the, the, the thing. Now remember, each kernel um, or, or the kernel itself is designed to execute on a single element of something. In this case, each element is an element in our array. And so basically, each kernel, every time it executes, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be given a global identifier, something that says, I am, you know, element number three. Okay, so I'm element number three. This is C, so we're zero based. Um, I'm element number uh, um, three, and um, index number two, of course, but element number three. And I am going to have this value added to this value and stored at this point. So this is this is basically all it does. So each kernel is a work unit, or is a work item, and that work item affects each one of these little guys here okay so hopefully that made sense um, then uh, the second portion of OpenCL objects the executables are OpenCL uh, 
our compute programs. Um, a compute program is simply a collection of compute kernels and functions. And now this is an important concept because uh, when we when we start writing some kernels and we start looking at uh, kernels and, and things like that, uh, we can organize them however we want. Um, and we typically would tend to organize them, say, in a file, something you know that has you know all of our kernels maybe listed in it. But kernels can call functions within the same. Uh, file and uh, if you want to kind of keep your code like neat and clean or something like that or if you have a lot of kernels that you need to use throughout your program at various places you don't need to have 80 files or 80 strings or anything like that you can put them all in one place and then you can just call them and and you'll see how that works in a little bit but you can just call them from there now this also brings up a very sort of interesting point about uh, objects and, and kernels and things like that uh, one of the key things about OpenCL is, in terms of how it works, and we'll talk about this more in depth later, but is that there's this concept of using uh, JIT comp compilation, JIT, uh, just-in-time compilation, and there, 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 there are pros and cons to that. There are a lot of pros, actually, to it. Um, and in Snow Leopard, uh, the compiler that's used for OpenCL, I believe, is LLVM. I'm pretty sure it's 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 LLVM that does the compiling. It does JIT compilation on your kernels as your program's executing. And we'll talk about performance and, and, and all of those kinds of things because a lot of people are probably saying, well, how can that be efficient? I should probably just compile once and all this kind of stuff. But there are a lot of really good benefits to that. And the LLVM compilers um, are, are blindingly fast. Uh, they're just amazingly it's just it's just absolutely amazing. People, if you're a developer and you haven't used uh, LLVM yet, or um, you're uh, you know looking to use it, or if you have used, I mean, you, you know, I mean, they've really gone, uh, they've really put the effort out there to make this. Uh, it's just, it's just phenomenal. I mean, you, I mean, that's really all I can say. It's just really amazing. And so we'll talk more in depth about this a little bit later. But the point being that you write all of these things, they get compiled either at runtime or you can pre-compile them if you really need to and uh, as a program it gets loaded and then your OpenCL uh, program when it's running will call into that uh, and, and find the right um, find the right function and then or the right kernel fun kernel or function and um, execute that uh, when um, the you know when it needs to um, so along those lines, now that we've sort of discussed these, we need to talk about uh, work units. And work units are an important concept. And I'm going to compare this to uh, CUDA here for those of you who maybe who are coming from CUDA or just even conceptually when we think about work and, and things like that on the CPU. So um, a unit of work in OpenCL is called a work item. Okay. Typically, what we would tend to think of this, if you're uh, it, from CUDA, certainly, um, a work item is called a thread. But you can think of these things as threads, especially on the GPU, because each uh, instance of a kernel executing is typically done by a single thread. So you might have an array that consists of a million elements. There may be a million threads executing, and that might sound, you know, completely mind-boggling when we sit here and worry about, you know, eight threads or even, you know, some, you know, maybe twenty or thirty threads on a CPU executing, um, you know, for a process. You know, here we might be talking about millions of threads, and so uh, or tens of thousands of threads at the very least, I should say, um, and so. The, the idea that you know a thread and a work item are are closely related certainly on the GPU they they are they're almost identical but the specification has gone to some uh, has has gone through some great effort and rightly so to kind of get rid of the concept of of a thread because again it's a specification it's designed to be sort of agnostic of whatever the hardware is that it's running on or the uh, the, the the general model uh, computing model that it's executing under so. Uh, a work item is uh, a single unit of work, so if we're doing something on a single array, okay? Um, a group of work items are, or work items generally are, 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 are lumped into what's called a work group, okay? So in one dimension, if we look over here, we have what's called the ND range, um, and it has a size, and in this case, it is, uh, what's that, 14, 1, 2, 3. 14. Okay, so it's 14. So in this case, we would say our X, our ND range in X is uh, 14. So we have 14 work elements, and um, 
uh, I'm sorry, 14 work items, and they're all grouped into a single work group. Now, we could split up our work group. Our ND range would still be the same. Our ND uh, size would still be 14. But now we introduce sort of a, a, a new concept called the work group size. Um, it's a way of partitioning out our problems such that... Um, each so, so that we so that we break apart like the larger piece into smaller chunks and this will become very very clear when we start really talking about optimization and um, as, uh, as certainly on the GPU when we're when we need to have uh, uh, when we talk about like shared memory and local memory and things like that work groups are very very important on the GPU um, and so what what you'll typically tend to see is that the ND range size is referred to as the global size. So this is the size of the entire problem that we're that we're trying to uh, address. Um, and the work group size is referred to commonly as the local size. Now I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit and say that on the GPU, the local size um, needs to be uh, an even. Uh, it needs to divide evenly into the global size. It always has to do that. Um, but on the CPU, the local size is always one. And there's a technical reason for that, which we won't uh, discuss right now. It'll, it'll certainly come up later, but it's an important concept to know. Your local size is always one on a CPU. On a GPU, it just needs to be um, uh, evenly, uh, it needs to divide evenly into the uh, global uh, size. So hopefully that's a little bit clear. So that's in one dimension. In two dimensions, uh, it's very similar. We would have now two ND ranges. That is, we'd have you know an X and a Y dimension, um, X and Y dimension, and we also might have uh, work groups that are um, subpartitions of the total size, and so we can have. Um, uh, Again, it just has to be evenly divisible into into this. And there are certain numbers that we kind of typically want to hit. Uh, powers of 2 are always good, which this clearly is not. Um, but um, but powers of 2 are, are, are good and things like that. And then, of course, the concept extends also to three dimensions. So in OpenCL, work units um, can be uh, uh, one, two, or three dimensions. Uh, they have natural support for all three of those and there are intrinsic functions that make it very easy to index into those so you specify your ND range say as being a one or two dimensional problem up front and you get for free the ability to index in in a way that's very natural and logical so it's it's a really nice way uh, conceptually to break up problems and this is a great way to break up problems especially for scientific computation where you're typically having to deal with you know two or three dimensional space uh, so often you have to deal with you know multi-dimension space but uh, Currently, OpenCL just deals with uh, three-dimension, um, three-dimensional data uh, as as a maximum. Um, and so, then extending also the work group size concept, uh, we do have our ND range size. If we just look at one of these work groups, we now have work group size in X and work group size in Y, and it's the exact same kind of concept. These numbers, these values, don't have to be the same. Uh, so you don't have to have square problems, but uh, but again, whatever your uh, size is here, it must evenly divide here, and whatever the local size is here, must evenly divide over uh, into the uh, ND range size uh, on that axis. So that, those are those are important concepts, and I'll iterate uh, and I'll uh, I'll talk about those more, and 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 and, and we'll you know uh, go over that again. Uh, in, in context, so hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense if, if, if you're still having a little bit of a problem with that now. Um, work item identifiers. So like I said, you know, when we have these multi-dimension spaces, there's a way to get into them to, to find, um, you know, where we are in them. And uh, each work item, each kernel, and a work item, remember, is just a kernel executing. Uh, it's a, it's a kernel executing. Each work item is aware of what element of a problem it's working on because it can query OpenCL to get uh, to, to find out what its global ID um, or if, if, if the if we have the uh, workspace partition say we're on the GPU and we partition the workspace locally we can also get the local ID um, and there are built-in functions uh, get global ID get local ID um, and uh, we tell it uh, uh, either 0 1 or 2 depending on whether we're trying to get the X Y or Z coordinate information and so on this uh, up here, if we look at this, if I say, you know, get global ID, um, say zero, um, but I'm work element number two 
okay? So say I'm the kernel executing here, okay? My global ID is going to come back as 2. If I'm the element working here, my global ID is going to come back as 6 and so forth in a one-dimensional problem. So, um, so there, there's, there's easy ways to get that to get to that information very very quickly from within your kernel so you know where you are and you know what say data you need to load or operate on and things like that and that's what really makes this this work and this what uh, one of the things that makes this very very powerful um, so if we talk a little bit more about kernels um, kernels again it's basically uh, the C programming language with some additions we've talked about this there are 2d and 3d image types we have built-in methods so you know if you want to declare 2d and 3d image types um, they're built-in methods get uh, local ID there's a whole list of them and we'll use a lot of them and talk about them there are barriers and and weight synchronization points things like that um, ways to sort of query the hardware uh, a little bit not within your kernel but um, outside the kernel as part of the uh, implementation as well um, and then there are vector data types and that's probably one of the more useful thing and there are other some there are some other semantics to the language which are very very powerful and very nice um, and greatly simplify uh, how you write code and access data elements and things like that but uh, the vector data types are probably of the most uh, immediate interest where uh, for example we all know what a float is or what an int is but the the concept of having vector data types where we group floats together or we group ints together where we could have something like a float 2 so that would be uh, a vector type consisting of two floats but functionally that are loaded and worked on as uh, as a unit um, so, for example, in float 2 is 1, but you could have float 4s. And there are multiple ways to specify this. The, the, the language or the, um, the specification allows you to specify floats. They say like float 2 is float 2 or CL underscore float 2. So there, 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 are, there are different ways to, to do this if, there, if you need to um, protect. Uh, so you don't have like collisions between you know naming conventions and things like that. CL float two is designed, uh, CL underscore float two is defined in the specification a very specific way um, to mean something very specific. Whereas float two may be you know if if you pull it from another header or something like that and you get some weird conflict or something like that you that you don't catch, it could be defined to mean something completely different. And so there are ways to always guarantee that you uh, are always using the right data type. Um, in, in OpenCL. So uh, continuing uh, with kernels. Now remember again we said that each kernel uh, is, is executes as its own work item. Okay, On the GPU each one of those work items executes as its own thread. Okay, So again if we go back to this to this uh, to this you know array thread number one or thread zero but we'll be working on this element thread 14 or 13 depending on how we're you know really indexing them uh, will be working on this element here our instance of the kernel will be dealing with this element um, as I mentioned GPUs can host you know thousands of threads in, I mean, it's just unbelievable, and the reason is because uh, they deal with thread and uh, threads and thread management in hardware. So context switching between threads is very uh, fast. Uh, they're they're very lightweight, and since they're managed in hardware, it's 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 very. Um, it's a it's a very efficient process it, it, as opposed to if you contrast that with on the CPU where thread management is done in software up um, typically by, by the kernel and things like that so um, thread management there's dedicated hardware for that context switching is very fast and the fact that there could be thousands of threads running um, at the same time doesn't necessarily mean they're all running simultaneously you can kick off as many threads as you want um, and there are sweet spots for this of course but you can kick off as many threads as you want um, and the hardware will manage that and the reason why you typically tend to do this um, as we'll talk about later um, in other podcasts is uh, to hide things like memory latency on the GPU so once your data is over there there, there there are certain levels of memory and we'll actually talk about this in, in a second um, there, there, there are certain levels of memory where we have fast memory and then you have really really fast memory and so those are the things that the thread management hardware does so that if a piece of data that a thread needs isn't really there or ready yet it's just going to context switch and it's going to go pick a different thread that's ready to go execute that and then switch back and things like that so that's that's all there and it's very it's a very very efficient process on the GPU 
So let's talk about memory and um, let's talk about address spaces. So in OpenCL, there are four types of address spaces. Um, and I and up here I'm showing this uh, in also uh, relative to what they're called in CUDA for for those of you maybe who are coming from CUDA or just so you kind of get uh, some some sort of idea of of what this is. Um, this is um, this is really the, the the sort of canonical diagram that people use for GPUs, and this is the more important part. If you, if the, if certainly if you have questions in terms of how this would be done on the CPU, certainly. You've, you know, welcome to ask, but there's a lot, I mean, there's a huge body of information out there in terms of uh, CPU, CPU architecture, CPU design, and I can also recommend some books and things like that if, if, if those things are of interest to you, but um, there, there's, there's a lot of that. And I really want to talk about the GPU because I think this is probably conceptually the thing that's the most new for the, for, for the largest number of people um, who might be interested in this technology. So um, the CPU is really broken up into, um, I'm sorry, the GPU is broken up into, into these, you know, uh, conceptually into these different sort of areas. And so we have global memory. This is the big chunk of memory. So if somebody says, you know, I have a, a graphics card with 512 megs of, uh, of of memory on it, they're talking about this sort of global memory pool. Um, and that is addressed using the underscore underscore global qualifier. So if you recall back, you know, f you know a few slides back when we were uh, talking about showing an example of a kernel, we said something, you know, underscore underscore global const, here's our, you know, thing. Uh, we were talking about accessing memory for from the global pool. That's where that memory exists. And there, we'll talk in a lot of detail about this later, but um, this is what we're referring to, that big chunk of memory that where we put, put all the data first and then where we access it while we're uh, running our, our calculation or our program. There's constant memory, so um, and and there's the constant memory, constant memory cache. This would t this would also commonly be like say your texture caches, uh, things like that, where you have um, where you have uh, values and variables that you need to access a little bit faster um, or more readily and you want to have them sort of backed by something, this is where you would put uh, th that kind of information. There's also local memory and the local memory is memory that's associated with a compute unit. And this The compute unit is you know where all of the actual math and all that kind of stuff is being done, um, but this memory is very, very special. Uh, if you contrast it to the global memory, the global memory on, and I, the numbers in my head right now for uh, I believe the 8800 GT um, but in that card access to global memory I think is somewhere around 70 gigabytes per second it's fast I mean that is really really fast I mean you might be thinking wow I mean that's that's fast but for the GPU it's really not um, because when you compare it to the local memory the stuff that's really close by and the stuff that's used uh, primarily ideally by these uh, by the compute units, um, that ac the access to that memory can occur somewhere on the order of, um, I believe, I want to say like around 750 gigabytes per second or something. So it's definitely an order of magnitude faster. Um, my numbers may be a little bit off, but I mean, it's it, I'm pretty sure it's at least an order of magnitude faster. In fact, it's so fast, if you have your data in there, um, you can typically think of that shared memory, that local memory pool, okay, as being... Um, registers. I mean just it, it's almost as fast as accessing register um, registers in the um, in the compute unit itself. It's, it's really that fast. But it's limited. It's not nearly as large as the global memory pool. You might only have um, 800 uh, or, or 16 kilobytes I think is typically what's what's there. 16 kilobytes of local memory associated with each compute unit and you may have 16 or so compute units throughout a, a GPU or, or, or 32 or 64. It really just depends on what the design is and things like that. Um, and so that's local memory. It's super, super fast. And then finally, there's private address space. Private address space is address space that is completely uh, local to the kernel itself. So if you if you if you declare a variable in scope, for example, um, that is effectively your 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 private address space. Or if you allocate, a, say, like a small like an array, what you would think of like if we were to allocate an array on the stack or something like that, that would be um, that would be considered um, uh, uh, the private memory. That is, one thread cannot access the memory of the other thread. Now, the other thing actually which I didn't mention and I should when we're talking about local memory is that local memory is accessible to all of the threads in a compute unit. Okay, so let's say you have 16 threads that are part that are executing on this compute unit. Okay, 
um, all of these threads, this thread can see this memory and it can see the memory maybe that this one is accessing. So for example, if they have to share information between them, okay, if this thread needs to share information with this thread, it would do it with, in local memory. And remember, groupings of threads are also uh, are work items. Uh, each thread is a work item. Groupings of work items are called work groups. So each work group is executing on a compute unit. Each uh, work group consists of threads, and those threads, or work items, I should say, sorry, I, I'm, I'm using them interchangeably, um, but uh, wor the work items um, each uh, have access to each other's local memory, okay? Uh, they do not have access to each other's private memory. So those are so that that's memory, and again, there's just these different layers: uh, private, local, constant, and global, and they're all color coded here, just so you can kind of get an idea of what we're talking about. Global memory is the slowest to access; local memory is significantly faster. And anything that's really in private memory, is, I believe, I, I I could be I could be mistaken, but I believe it's kept actually in register, um, so that's also accessed extremely fast. So um, that is those are the address spaces. Hopefully that conceptually that makes um, sense. We'll really be hammering and talking about this in a lot more detail when we when we start designing kernels and, and talking about kernel design and things like that. So if it's not gelling now, it'll certainly gel um, a little bit later for you. It's an important concept, though, to, to understand. So if there are questions, um, certainly uh, get in touch with me, and uh, we'll address them in future podcasts. So um, the OpenCL um, API. Uh, I should point out that the API and specification, you can view them at... Uh, on the Kronos Group uh, website under OpenCL. It's all there. Uh, you can download it as a PDF. You can look through it. They even have this really nice um, little sort of like cheat sheet uh, card kind of thing that has all of the functions listed and whatnot and like one nice uh, data types, all that kind of stuff, built-ins, um, all listed like in one little neat location. It's it's really great. Um, so, you can, so you can get all that information there. So I encourage you to check it out. Um, now, in terms of using the API, there's really five main steps that we would need to go through uh, in order to run an OpenCL calculation. That is, we need to initialize uh, OpenCL. Uh, we have to allocate our resources, uh, so that would be you know memory and things like that. Uh, we need to create, put together our programs and our kernels. We need to execute them, and then since we're good uh, programming citizens, we need to tear down and release any memory we've allocated and things like that. So uh, let's walk through an example uh, calculation. This isn't. Uh, this is actually taken from some some real code, but it's it's kind of abstracted away, just so that it's not uh, too busy. We'll do, we'll do real code in the um, uh, in, in the next podcast. Um, so uh, we're going to do an example calculation. We're going to process a two D array of data. Um, we're using the GPU in this example. Um, the data is going to come from, let's say, an image file, but a buffer, an 8-bit, let's say, grayscale image. And like I said, the details of the calculation aren't really important. It's just kind of just to give you sort of a walkthrough of the steps and what you need to do, you know, to get from uh, start to finish. And so the image conceptually is going to be, let's say, this image of um, my good friend here, um, Bub Rub. Actually, he's not my good friend. I don't know him. But there's this great video on YouTube uh, years ago came out about these whistle tips in California. Some somebody interviewed him. It's 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 super funny and it's so funny. I've put the uh, the link to the YouTube video is listed at the end. It's just really funny. Check it out um, it, if 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 you're in the mood for for a laugh. So anyway, um, the example calculation. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take our problem and we're going to operate on every pixel in this image. Um, and we're going to conceptually break up this. It's a 2D problem, so our ND range so, uh, size is going to be 2. We have an X and Y dimension. And we're going to break it up into um, each dimension into two work groups. Okay, So we're effectively partitioning our problem into four um, work group spaces. Now, in reality, you would never do something this coarse grain on the GPU. Your work groups are going to be much bigger in terms of the number of elements per you know, unit, um, and you're going to have a lot more of them. But uh, just, just you know, to make it look nice on the screen, I'm just breaking it up into four. But just pretend each one of these is a really, really big pixel or something like that, and uh, that'll kind of get you the the idea there. So initialization. The first thing that we have to do is we need to select a device. So you can get um, all of the devices that exist in a system. Um, you can either get the first one or you can get an array of them. Uh, return type. Um, so we ask, you know, what devices we pull, what devices are available, and in 
this case I'm looking specifically for GPUs. You can uh, look specifically for CPUs or you can ask, you know, give me all of the devices and then you can just sort through them and figure out which one you want to use. Uh, we need to create a context. The context uh, is associated with that specific device that you're going to run your calculation on and um, that context is what's used uh, is, is effectively sort of like the backing store, if you will, uh, for all of the information associated with uh, the, the, the job and, and things like that. And then within that, we're going to create a command queue. And that command queue is where we're going to, um, if, if we need to, say, uh, issue the command to push data out to the GPU, uh, it'll go into the command queue, and then the command queue will execute that when we, either when we tell it to execute, if we force it to, or when it, when it, when it gets to that, to that point, it will then go and execute the commands that are in the command queue. So the command queue is effectively your list of instructions that say, okay, do this, now do this, now run this kernel, now do this, now read this, now write this out, that kind of stuff, okay? So the next step is allocation. Now we want to do a calculation, we need some memory, okay? So we've got, um, we've got our buffer. Um, we're going to create a buffer. Uh, it's going to be read-only memory, which means that we're going to put a bunch of data into it, okay? But we're never going to modify that. And there's there's differences because the compiler or the implementation might say, okay, if this is read-only memory, I'm going to try and stick it here uh, where it might be used uh, more efficiently or something like that. Um, and we're also going to enqueue the write. That is, we allocate the memory. We create the buffer here, okay? But we need to... Um, we need to do something with this. We need to fill it in, um, which is what we're kind of doing here with CL uh, and Q write buffer. Um, but then we also need to get that data pushed out to the graphics card. Remember, all of this code is executing on the C is executing over on the, the host itself, the, the main portion of the, the computer. And we need to get the data from the uh, CPU uh, or I'm sorry, from the host over onto the compute device itself. And this is what this command will do. It'll say effectively, take this uh, memory that's coming from my real buffer you're going to stick it into this open cl memory object buffer and um and queue this command into the command queue okay and then finally once we've done all this we're going to say okay now go go do this um if you if you let it set uh it, it will do it eventually um but it might not do it right then and there and say for example uh if you want the uh the, the right to happen um before you go and execute some other sets of commands um you need you want you want to specify this now when i say you know before you want to do some other commands i'm saying some auxiliary functions that you might call over in the main portion of your application uh unless you explicitly tell opencl to uh execute out of order it will always execute the commands in the order that they're put into the queue um by default that is the default so if you put this in here this uh write command here and then you have another one Whatever order they go in is the order that they're going to be executed in. So, so you don't have to worry about things happening randomly, but you just want to be aware that you might want all of this data loaded up before, let's say you start a timer and you, you don't want to get some accurate measurements of timing or something like that. So anyway, that's allocation. And so then moving on, we've got um, program, the, the, the program and kernel creation where we have um, our programs. Our programs are simply, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a file sitting someplace or it's a C string or something like that where we um, want to read it in and we want it to just generate the program and then we ask it to um, build the program and when we build the program that's actually when we're doing the uh, compilation part right that's when the that's when the just-in-time compilation is occurring okay and then uh, we want to actually create a kernel uh, we want to create a specific kernel from this program. And here what we're saying is this is our program that we've just built. I'm going to create a, sp a kernel. Uh, my first kernel is going to be called, uh, in this case, it's called MDH. And this comes from something else. I, sh I should have changed it. But uh, if you go back to the kernel example way, way back, when we called it sum, you would replace MDH with sum. And so that says that kernel, that the first kernel that I'm, uh, creating is uh, the sum kernel. I could have another kernel called uh, multiply, and that would be kernel two, it, it, you know, and so forth. And so we would create all of these kernels. You can create as many as you want, as many that as are in your program certainly, and then you go from there to um, to, to get that uh, uh, to get that going. So that's program kernel 
uh, creation. And then of course, once we have everything created, we want to execute this. So there's a couple things we need to do. If our kernel takes mul takes arguments, which it most certainly needs to, um, in order for it to do anything, um, we have to set those. And so we sort of set our kernel arguments up and uh, we enqueue our kernel into the command queue. Now that we've set up, you know, the kernel arguments, once those are all set up, we can then set up our command queue um, for, for, to execute this kernel. So basically what we're saying is in this command queue, execute this kernel, the ND range size is two. It's a two-dimensional problem. Okay, so our global work size is two. Okay, we have an NX, an, uh, X and Y dimension. But we're also gonna do this, we're also gonna partition the problem into local work size, okay? Our local work size is broken up into two, but the number of elements when they're referring to the actual size um, is the number of elements in that dimension that are gonna be processed. So uh, so for in this case it would be nx divided by two or ny divided by two. Let me let me let me say that again a different way. We partition our problem um, in each dimension into two chunks okay in a two-dimensional problem that means we have four chunks okay but the number of elements this is always referring to the number of elements that we're gonna want to process the number of work items in each dimension so globally our work size okay the number of um, of work items say in the X dimension and X if we go back to the original example or to the, to the example a couple slides ago is 14 in the Y dimension it's also 14, okay? So uh, that means our local work size, if we want to partition it into two, our local work size is going to be seven and seven. Now, again, that being said, these numbers are terrible. Do not ever use 14 or seven or anything like that. It's, your, it's, it's a world of hurt you're begging for. It's just not going to work very well. So um, powers of two, they're, they're your friends. Uh, learn them, love them live with them it's powers of two okay um, and there's some key powers of two that we'll talk about especially when we when we start talking about um, uh, optimization and things like that so anyway so we get this in queued it's it's ready to go we might issue a, another CL finish uh, command queue just to force it to to actually execute and then when we're done of course we want to get our results back so we might read a buffer and we might read it from you know this this memory object, and we might store it into this array and um, and things like that. Um, and then when we're done, of course, we want to release all of these things. We want to free up the memory that we've allocated, um, that's been allocated and used to generate our kernel and our program, our command queue, and our context. Only because we're good citizens. If your program's about to terminate, you can be lazy and sloppy about it and just let it go. But you know we we want to be good uh, good good citizens here and. And, and the primary reason being uh, that you may do other things in your program and you might only need to instantiate this once. So you don't want memory leaking or anything like that. But typically uh, you won't. You'll, you'll, you'll build your programs and your kernels and everything. You'll do that once and then you'll just reuse them over and over again. And I'll try to drive that point home in the uh, in the next and one of the later podcasts at least just so you kind of get a feel for this and so you're not also doing inefficient things like rebuilding your program uh, every recompiling it every single time you try to execute the kernel say for example so uh, those are the steps hopefully hopefully that's clear that at least gives you some kind of idea of what's involved in going from you know start to finish and getting things there I know it, it's 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 a little out of context and it might seem a little bit confusing but uh, just sort of having this right now will at least uh, it'll it'll certainly help so that way when we get to the other stuff and we, and we go through this it, it won't be a shock to the system or it won't seem overly complicated at least at the time so if you can understand this you're 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 99 percent there honestly I mean the rest of this is really a cakewalk so um, so you, so you should be in, in pretty good shape and so with that we'll kind of we'll kind of end this um, again if you want um, more information you can go to macresearch.org opencl all the episodes are going to be posted there I'm working on an iTunes link right now um, so you'll also be able to uh, subscribe to this via iTunes and you can just download the podcast directly via iTunes I am going to do my best to make sure that they work on uh, the desktop but also on your iPhone phones and iPod touches and things like that. Uh, I got a couple requests about that as well. So uh, I, I'm, this is still new to me. I'm still figuring it out. So just bear with me. Um, but if there are problems, certainly let me know. 
we'll get that sorted out here uh, really quick, and you'll be able to be able to, uh, to to have these in multiple formats. Again, uh, if you're if you're thinking of buying Snow Leopard, or if there are things that you know we have on our Amazon store, uh, if you want to buy them through there, that would be great. You'd really be helping us out. Uh, we've had a lot of people uh, get Snow Leopard through there. Uh, a few other things. If there's something up there that you want to buy and you want to throw us a you know you know uh, throw us a bone and really really help us out. If it's not up there. Shoot me an email. We'll put it up there. Um, it, it really helps us out um, in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, so we, we appreciate that. Uh, you can get more inform information about the OpenCL spec from the Kronos website. So go go there to see the spec and, um, and, and and to see some of the other stuff, say OpenGL and things like that. And then, of course, the uh, Bub Rub video, uh, if you need a laugh, uh, definitely check that out. It's uh, it's, it's quite humorous. Uh, it's, it's very, very good. So um, anyway, so with that, we'll end this. Um, if there are questions, comments, uh, concerns, um, well, no concerns. I, I don't want to hear those. But uh, if there's any questions or comments, certainly um, you know how to get in touch with me. And I hope you enjoyed this uh, podcast, and I'll um, see you next time.